Okay, this is Roland Paris uh, from the Center for International Policy Studies, and I'm here with Steve Call, president of the New America Foundation. Steve, welcome to Ottawa. Thanks, Roland. You mentioned in your presentation here uh, today that uh, the assumptions on which NATO and Western strategy are based um, for Afghanistan are largely flawed. Um, and you enumerated a number of those assumptions. And um, you suggested that it's not too late to begin a really serious rethinking of those assumptions right now. Uh, which of those assumptions do you think is most problematic and needs to be tackled first? I think it's that Afghanistan will be politically able to uh, digest a rapid transition in its security arrangements in 2014. I think the greatest strategic risk to the NATO's um, policy and investments in Afghanistan is that the country essentially cracks up under the pressure of the transition in 2014. And that's fundamentally a political problem uh, more than anything else. And it's very specific because of the calendar in 2014, which involves a presidential election, possibly a parliamentary election. Accompanying that are other sources of pressure, such as discussions about de devolving political power to the provinces or districts, changing the uh, constitutional bargain that was struck at Bonn, and talking to the Taliban. So you add all of that together, uh, you know that's a pr that's a pretty tough transition. And no security strategy that is linked to a f to a cracking government is worth anything. So that crack up would be the worst case scenario. How would that how how would you see that crack up taking place? What does that mean in practice? What are some of the ways in which a crack up might actually occur? Well, if if an excluded uh, faction under arms that is currently inside the constitutional tent decided to revolt against the government, um, that would be the form of it. It might take the form of a mutiny within the army, or it might take the form of the mobilization of militia violence um, outside of uh, even the extent to which that already takes place. Um, and some momentum by the Taliban into uh, urban areas from which they're currently sort of held out would probably be required to trigger such a thing, but a bad election um, could produce intra-northern violence, for example, um, of a sort that hasn't featured over the last 10 or 11 years. We're seeing violent protests this week as a result of the accidental burning of um, Koran, of copies of the Koran uh, by the U.S. military, uh, and the decision by NATO to pull personnel out of Afghan ministries. How does that um, Afghan reaction and the violence and some of the protests that we've seen figure into your analysis of uh, how things are going, where things are heading, and what the prospects are for a potential crack up. Right. Well, it's disturbing. It hasn't yet reached strategic dimensions, but it reflects a couple of um, factors that are um, of real importance. One is, of course, the Taliban have been conducting an assassination and infiltration campaign for a couple of years now. That has been their asymmetric response to the surge, which was essentially to realize uh, there's no sense running ourselves at Western tanks all day long. Let's look for um, more targeted ways to attack the premises of the Western strategy by uh, decapitating political leaders infiltrating the security forces, recruiting defectors, and resisting the West's attempts to recruit us. That's essentially been the Taliban strategy. And so to some extent, the uh, violence that occurred this week where a couple of American advisors apparently were shot in the back of the head by a man using a silencer, a pistol with a silencer, sounds like that might have been part of the assassination and infiltration campaign rather than directly tied to the Koran burnings. However, um, there's violence in the streets that is being mobilized by political parties, uh, Islamist parties generally, but others as well. Uh, because political competition is beginning and because the country knows that NATO is leaving, the incentives for self-restraint are declining, uh, international leverage over Afghan political decision making is declining. Uh, Afghan, Afghans are nationalistic, as nationalistic as any other people and more than some. And when you mobilize politically for power after NATO, an anti-NATO uh, narrative is a pretty good one, as President Karzai himself demonstrates. So every time that the United States, through the 
um, the sheer um, facts of its occupation or its presence in the country makes a mistake of this character. There are going to be more people to exploit it than a year ago uh, and more than a year before that and some of this uh, exploitation of those mistakes may be pretty intense and it could even uh, because these narratives of um, dignity and national identity can be so powerful in a setting like Afghanistan uh, there's the possibility of a loss of control of what may have begun as opportunistic political uh, mobilization um, because of the, the character of some of these issues. I mean, burning Qurans is about as fundamental as it gets um, in that respect. So I don't mean to dwell on the, on the negative and the nightmare scenarios, because in a moment I'm going to ask you about some of the better uh, possible uh, outcomes. But how bad could this bad case, this worst case scenario get? Could, the, could there be uh, the uh, civil war on the scale of what we saw in the 1990s? I mean, how, when you think about the negative scenarios, given the circumstances that exist now in Afghanistan as opposed to, that, to those that existed uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, how, how bad could this bad scenario be? Well, I don't think it's... Um overly pessimistic to worry that it could be worse than the 1990s uh, because the conditions in the country have changed in a way that would make a civil war likely more violent. Um, you've, the United States has, uh, and NATO have come in and building an Afghan security force with modern weapons, uh, modern training, modern tactics. Um, this is not the degraded, criminalized, uh, sort of Mad Max militia world of the early 1990s. This, these are, this is the, uh, an army in the making, and it's reasonably well equipped. And, and so if it went uh, against itself, um, you could, as in the 1980s, when a professional army in Afghanistan kind of melted away and turned to civil conflict. That early phase of the war in the 1980s was terribly violent. And um, here as well, you have a, proxy, a potential proxy contest fundamentally between India and Pakistan, but with other players, that um, also looks like it's, um, you know, it has, has kind of growth hormones in comparison to the 1990s. The national resources that India would bring to bear are much greater than before. Its motivation may be more ardent than in the 1990s. And uh, so um, I think I don't consider that likely. I do consider it more likely than, for example, another uh, sometimes a negative scenario that's projected, which would be the return of the Taliban to national power. I don't regard that as likely. Um, it can't be ruled out. I could certainly imagine the Taliban taking some cities that would disturb Afghans and the international community, but um, I think a civil war is more likely than a return to Kabul. Why is that? Why do you not? Because I don't think the Taliban could get into Kabul without a really nasty fight, and the nasty fight would be the beginning of the civil war, and I think the northern groups are stronger, strong enough uh, to hold space for at least several years, especially because there's, there's sort of strategic depth, both as a practical matter, their supply lines, who would be supporting them with money and legitimacy and, and perhaps weapons, those look um, reliable. And even um, NATO governments might individually or otherwise decide that, um, that these are the legitimate rump forces of the Afghan state. And hold them off at least Kabul. Yeah, at least hold them. Yeah. Kabul. Okay, so you've described uh, this um, worst case scenario. What realistically is the best case scenario for 2014 and beyond? Well, it's the status quo plus a political transition, essentially. Uh, yeah, that you have uh, Afghan cities in possession of a weak state, but uh, in possession of that state. You have large populations that are essentially secure in those cities, um, that the Taliban control substantial sections of the countryside, but in, but are often in a state of accommodation with Afghan security forces, informal local truces arranged, uh, territory carved up, smuggling rackets carved up. Uh, and somehow that Afghan sort of uh, island, city island state with link communications um, holds together uh, because enough Afghans want that stable that stable uh, politics so as to sell copper to the Chinese and sell iron ore to the Indians and um, you know pump in gas from Turkmenistan and continue to draw off a declining uh, but still substantial amount of international flows into the country uh, 
and also because they don't want to go back to, to war. They want to consolidate the gains in education and security that they've made in the last 10 years, and they're not prepared to just throw that all over. They know how awful a return to civil war would be. Uh, it's a living memory, and so that, I think, is in itself a constraint. Karzai is uh, going to be, at least in theory, term limited out in 2014. Uh, you mentioned before uh, the importance of that political transition. How, how important is the political transition to achieving your best case outcome? And how can that political transition, what is the best that one can hope for in the transition itself, do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's fundamental. Um, and I think um, what it's made of is through Afghan decision making, Afghan voting, Afghan negotiations, um, an Afghan pro constitutional process scrutinized by independent Afghan media, um, refereed by an international election monitoring system that is strong and credible enough to insist on fair play, that um, out of the leadership transition in the palace, um, you hold together the fractious, uh, disputatious, but nonetheless um, intact accommodations between what really is still a plurality, a majority of Pashtuns, um, and the entirety of the anti-Taliban coalition. That's, that's essentially, that is the social basis for the, for the current weak Afghan state, and that somehow out of this transition, that remains intact. So that the Taliban remain on the outside of the constitutional system, knocking on the door, trying to get in, and there is a, a robust uh, set of accommodations, even with a lot of arguing and shouting and, and disagreements, that holds that group together. Um, now, one of the difficulties is the extent to which international policy has located so much weight in the palace that has made it such a heavy prize, uh, and it, it kind of is a, it's a form of unbalancing just the sheer prize that the palace represents in terms of corruption opportunities, patronage opportunities, and etc. And you've had one occupant, a family, a series of other rent seekers that have attached themselves to that family. And it, it's not a very, it doesn't seem to me a very um, fungible uh, entity. And how you kind of hand it off, um, I think, is, is really uh, difficult. But uh, on the other hand, the parliament, though, um, you know, filled with criminals and warlords and, you know, so is India's parliament. <laughs> uh, it has emerged as a, you know, a, a symbol of Afghan aspirations in, in a flawed but real way. And uh, it's a plural uh, entity. It has a sense of its uh, role. Uh, that role has roots in Afghan history. There have been senates and parliaments before. It has a sort of shura aspect to it. And uh, it has asserted itself uh, effectively from time to time. And when the international community has supported it, uh, it has rallied to that support. So there, it's not just that the palace transition has to occur. The, the, the broader set of um, political accommodations you know, also has to transition. But there are some strengths there is the point I'm making. Recognizing what you just said, that it's not all just about the president and that, in fact, relying too heavily on the palace has been a flaw of policy up until now. The, I, I presume that you would agree that the capability, the capacity, the, the abilities of the president, whoever the post-Karzai president is, will be critical in determining whether we end up with a more or less positive outcome. Is there anybody in the Afghan political scene who has the political skills to be able to strike the balance and manage this uh, system uh, in the way that you've described? It's not evident who that would be who is also electable. Um, I think this is probably a um, situation which you can think of analogies elsewhere where um, if such a leader is hidden in the system, they're going to emerge um, through action and um, not be um, obvious from the front. There are some characters um, who might, in a sort of power-broking sort of way, um, be able to handle 
the inheritance um, of the palace and hold some of this together. But they don't have the international um, vernacular that would be required to maintain uh, international trust and financial commitments. Um, so Gulag assures, uh, you know, for example, could he really, um, would he ever really be um, a plausible partner of the international community? Well, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, the people who the international community would list as its plausible partner don't have Gulag assures as vote back. So um, I, that's why I think a transparent, competitive, engaged approach to this transition is so important because what you don't want is some kind of backhand or deal between uh, the president and his vice president or one faction or another. Um, that seems unlikely to, to be workable. So you've set out um, a, a range of possible scenarios here, beginning with the quite negative and then describing one where it's a continuation more or less of the current situation, holding it together in a sense, and potentially a long-term equilibrium if the transition could be handled well. Um, now I'd like you to look into your crystal ball um, and think about the trajectory that we're currently on. Here we are in early uh, 2012, looking through to 2014. Where does that trajectory take us if the trajectory is not changed? Um, I, I think failure is more likely than success if the trajectory is not changed because I don't believe that the, this is just my analysis, um, I don't see the lines of American-led policy uh, joining uh, in the destination of a successful political transition. I see a lot of parallel policies. Um, some of them on automatic pilot, some of them based on flawed assumptions, um, and an exhaustion, uh, really, uh, with the hard work that is uncertain and um, there's no guarantees that it'll succeed, and um, there are a lot of incumbent obstacles to uh, a kind of refresh approach and a real uh, willingness to invest in, in this risky political transition. For all those reasons, I fear that there's this kind of automatic pilot of uh, these flawed policies. Now, what are their specific consequences? Well, building up an army that's too large and not politically tethered, um, and without really thinking that through, uh, hurtling into an election that's likely to be riddled with fraud without anticipating uh, that and managing in advance, and um, and then depriving Afghans of the visibility of their own kind of power sharing choices as they go through 2014 by over egging the negotiations with the Taliban around which there is not really a national consensus that's fully formed, it's partially formed. Um, and that really has been all of the political strategy of late. And I think all those things together just uh, seem to me to be creating potentially unsound foundations for 2014. Speaking of negotiations with the Taliban, what is the role of Pakistan in those negotiations? Well, I think they would like one, um, but they're um, being cautious and minimally active so far. Um, I think it's always hard to judge um, motivations a little easier to see actions and maybe guess at motivations. Um, I guess my own judgment is that basically Pakistan's timelines are very different from NATO's in, in reference to the Taliban's negotiations. It is in Pakistan's interest to see the Taliban uh, included in an Afghan political settlement that um, draws the many Afghan Taliban who are living in Pakistan off of Pakistani soil and involves them in Afghan affairs and that does not radicalize them so that they meld with other Pakistani insurgent groups and seek the overthrow of the Pakistan state. That's what Pakistan's interests are. But those interests are going to be around for a long time, for as long as Afghanistan is around. They also don't want Afghanistan to become a launching pad for a second front for Indian forces or an encirclement strategy by India. Um, and that problem is going to be around for a long time. So 2014, I mean, that's a drop in the bucket from, from GHQ's perspective. And the very fact that the United States is all panicked about getting something organized by 2014, when they look at that and say, well, you know, I, you've got the watches, we've got the time, but our interests are, are here forever. And in fact, uh, 
what that translates to, just to answer your question directly, is a, is a habit of caution, I think. I, I understand it. I mean, if I were GHQ, I would be cautious. Why would I take risks with an already precarious equation with these militant groups, um, you know, battling my own domestic insurgency? Why would I unbalance my own position for the sake of a NATO timeline, given the way NATO has treated me anyway? You, you just described Pakistani interests a moment ago, and during your presentation you, you made the point that uh, the United States and uh, Pakistan, and for that matter Afghanistan, have uh, at, at a very core level more convergent interests now perhaps than they ever have sin had since, uh, since September 11, 2001, yet, uh, at least between the United States and Pakistan, the level of cooperation has never been lower. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and, and given what you just said about the different timelines, is there any prospect to be able to uh, overcome these impediments of cooperation and the distrust that's built up between the United States and Pakistan in time to be able to build upon, recognize, and make policy based on a mutual recognition of shared interest? Yeah, it'll be hard. Uh, you know, the trust problem is probably the deepest and the, and the slowest uh, to be sort of um, pliable. And at the same time, there is a recognition in both capitals um, that the timeline is what it is. That NATO is going in this short period of time. A political, it's been Pakistan all along, it's been arguing for more prominence to a political approach to the transition. They've been frustrated by the Americans' uh, military led, counterinsurgency doctrine led approach where if there was a political aspect to the counterinsurgency sur uh, conceived surge, it was uh, first subordinate to boots on the ground and then really more about reintegration, formation of local militias. It really wasn't a political strategy in a regional or a uh, kind of constitutional sense. And the Pakistanis were always much more focused on that. And uh, so their interests lie in the revival of that uh, framework as a response to the exposure of the flaws of the surges framework and so that gives them that brings them into the but what would they actually do as a practical matter now that's that's I think um, the harder question on the Taliban they can be useful um, they'll be cautious uh, in part because they have understandable questions about what the United States actually intends with these negotiations um, but more because their interests are to move slowly Last question for you uh, about Pakistan. How do you see the political future unfolding of that country? I think uh, I was struck on this last visit that things there are not so bad. Um, now maybe I've just been traveling there too often and become so trapped by a relativist <laughs> perspective that, that um, I'm missing it. But first of all, the economy is growing. It's growing three and a half, four percent. Industrial exports are up. The agricultural sector is booming. Uh, the insurgency has been contained, casualties are down 30 percent, level of violence is still unaccept unacceptably high, but it's been uh, pushed out of the cities. The sense of menace and, and collapse uh, over the horizon that was present just a couple of years ago, 2009, is gone. Lahore is calm, um, you know, Karachi is its old self, Islamabad hasn't been attacked in a while. A lot of the violence that does remain is increasingly sectarian. and located in um, the western provinces and in the tribal areas. Um, and um, civilian politics is rising. Uh, power is being shared in ways that it wasn't before. There's a very strong Supreme Court that has created a genuine check on the army. The army is marginalized in a political sense. It can't intervene in politics anymore without facing mass resistance. We may see very well, it's quite likely that we will see the first uh, peaceful transfer of power from one elected civilian government to another in Pakistan's history later this year. Uh, and the nationalism that so discomforts the United States is actually a, a kind of uh, purging of Pakistan's own experience of the last 10 years and a, recl a, a reclamation of a sort of synthesis of urban-led politics and sovereignty that it feels it was taken away from it both by the combination of military rule and the subordination to U.S. policy interests in the country. I think it's all very healthy. Um, now, you know, it's still a very troubled country, falling down the human in development index scale, power deficits, electricity deficits, of energy deficits, all kinds of problems. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not all bad. And 
uh, I, uh, last point, you know, uh, quite a lot of people observe that Afghanistan's ultimate stability and indeed Pakistan's really depends on a, on a resolution of the Indo-Pakistani conflict, that that is the fundamental divide that plays itself out in so many regional settings. Well, you know, in a managed way, Indo-Pakistani rapprochement is gathering and uh, some trade agreements have been made. I think there's a shared vision of how trade, economic normalization as a next step will uh, tie, will be the basis for a, a general uh, normalization of Indo-Pakistani ties. And, um, you know, the United States has played a very helpful role in encouraging Indo-Pakistani rapprochement by becoming the enemy that unites everyone. <laughs> and uh, so when, Indo when, when India and Pakistan make their grand bargain, I think the, whoever's president of the United States, that I'm going to say, we replaced India as the prime enemy of Pakistan, and by doing so, allowed the Pakistanis to reconcile with their neighbors. So they can, we, we're the, we're like Maybe the, they can the, rewrite Obama's uh, Nobel yes, Prize exactly. citation. <laughs> yes. But I mean, literally 80% of Pakistanis in public opinion polling regard the United States as an enemy, and only 50% regard India as an enemy, and they fought three wars against India. Well, they, they, I guess they feel they're fighting one now against the United States. But. Steve Cole, thank you for coming to Ottawa. Thank you for visiting SIPS. It's been a pleasure talking to Thanks, you. Thanks, Roland. Thanks for having me.